I recently did a poll on Twitter asking what kind of videos you guys want to see, and the clear majority was builds, quickly followed behind that by mods, and then reviews and all that other crap. So I figured today, since Christmas just ended, a lot of people were probably shopping for new parts. You probably didn't get the parts you wanted, so now you're like, fine, I'll be my own Santa, and you're gonna buy yourself some stuff. I figured, why don't we do the reasonable build? The build that's not about saving as much money as possible, but giving you great performance today that gives you room to improve and grow and build that PC stronger in the future without having to buy all new parts. Get your next gaming PC from Build Redux. Compare pricing to buying the parts yourself and stop overpaying. Pick your starting budget, see your estimated gaming performance, and then see your PC based on your choices. Plus, Redux offers a growing support hub to answer all your questions. And it's backed by a two-year parts and labor warranty, so you're covered. Pick your budget, pick your games, and get Build Redux. You know, I'm not gonna lie, being a tech reviewer, specifically in the PC genre on YouTube, is a fun place to be. We get to play with the highest end parts. We get to have just completely, like a complete run in the mill of whatever builds we wanna do. But you know what? That is not the average consumer's experience. In fact, that is a very, very, very small subset of a subset of buyers that are able to even begin to dream about building the kind of computers that YouTubers are able to build. So oftentimes to bring yourself back down to ground, to the ground, you have to build something that is in the mindset of what is somebody looking to do today. Now there is obviously a lot of people out there that are like every single dollar in my budget counts. And to be honest, in terms of budgeting, whether it's a low end budget or a high end budget, that's the way you should look at it. But often when you build a budget PC, you shoehorn yourself into a certain path that has no upgradability. It has no future to it. And so today we took, I, I took a component list that I shopped around, really kind of aimed for more the middle ground on where the prices land, but specifically with upgradability in mind. So let's go and talk about the main platform today. The main platform that I chose for this is actually an Intel CPU. This is a 12600K. Now the one I actually used in the pricing list, which we'll kind of put down here, is actually the 12600KF, which is about 15 to $20 cheaper because it doesn't have an iGPU in there. If you have the extra 20 bucks, I highly recommend getting the non-KF, only because having an iGPU is very handy for things like troubleshooting your system. If you're having no graphics showing with your GPU, it helps to be able to at least have a secondary GPU option to be able to troubleshoot. Not to mention you get to keep and hang on to QuickSync. QuickSync is very handy if you're doing any sort of editing, if you're doing Premiere, even if you're doing OBS encoding and you wanna get the maximum amount of FPS available by having your GPU not have to worry about using the NVEC encoder if you're using an, a, an NVIDIA GPU. So you can have the iGPU that's sitting here doing nothing, doing something while you're live streaming and not impact any of your gaming performance with your GPU whatsoever. And in fact, it won't even impact your CPU performance really because the iGPU is so efficient with quick sync encoder to be able to handle that. Now, some of you right now are probably already typing your hate comments. Jay, what the heck? Why not the 5800X? The 5800X is an amazing CPU. You're absolutely right. This is a six core, uh, six performance cores, four efficiency cores for a total count of 16 threads. So is the 5800X. The 5800X at the time of filming this video comes in a few dollars more than even the, the non-K, uh, or the non-KF, the K. Depending on your workload, you might want to go with the 5800X. And they're right around the same price. The reason I ultimately chose the Intel is because of the fact that we can couple it with a Z690 DDR4 board, saving us money on RAM. But Jay, the AMD 5800X also uses DDR4. You're absolutely right. But remember that part I said about having an upgrade path? By using the Z690 motherboard, and to be fair, we could typically even save a little bit more money by not going with a Z690 and probably going with a B-series motherboard. The reason why I chose Z690 is because of the fact that we have an upgrade path to at least 13th gen. Now we don't know if the LGA 1700 socket is gonna live beyond that, but we know the 5800X is dead end on the AM4 platform. So you wouldn't be able to upgrade your CPU beyond the 5000 series CPU. However, on Intel, we've already shown that the 13th gen uplift over 12th gen is significant. So later on, if you wanted to go to like a 13600K, which has four more e-cores than this CPU, giving it uh, an, an amazing amount of uplift in performance, you'd be able to just swap out your CPU, update your BIOS, swap out your CPU, and guess what? You're up and running. 13900K, this board can handle it. And you're not gonna be dealing with the, the, the cost of DDR5 because we saved money by going with a DDR4 board. If you were to adopt 
AM5 off the bat right now, finding a CPU that's anywhere down into this low $200 range is not possible. They're not even out yet. And you're shoehorned into DDR5 because there is no DDR4 motherboard for AM5 yet. So the choice was pretty simple. If we're trying to go middle ground upgradability without spending a stupid amount of money today, but we have more to spend than those on a silly like $500 budget, which is very difficult to shop within today, it is the clear path that I chose. But you can substitute it with an AMD 5800X and a supporting motherboard in the same price point. And if you're fine with using that for the next three, four, five years, knowing there's no upgrade for you, then that's also a clear option for you. Now, RAM. I talked specifically about DDR4. I chose the Corsair Vengeance LPX. This is a 32 gigabyte kit. What we actually spec in here is a 16 gigabyte kit. I'll just be using two of these sticks because right now DDR4 pricing is kind of volatile. It's all over the place. When I did the eBay build, I was able to get 16 gigabytes of 3000 megahertz RAM, uh, RGB RAM from Newegg. Uh, yeah, Newegg on eBay, which is so weird. And it was about $54. When I shopped right now, it was 85 for the exact same RAM kit. We are talking a, like a 75% increase in cost, which is just weird. Um, you can get this for 49 bucks right now. If you don't care about the RGB, you care about performance, it's a 3200 megahertz stick, two eight gig sticks, which are gonna give us 16 gigabytes, which is plenty. Later on, you want more, just pop in two more sticks. Now the motherboard I chose, I already showed, this is the Asus Tough Gaming, the Z690 Plus Wi-Fi D4. So the D4 just designates that it's a DDR4 motherboard. Um, you can get them in DDR5. Although if we're trying to get the most reasonable performance for the most reasonable price, we know that in terms of gaming and stuff, DDR5 is not really worth the cost, at least not right now. It also has Wi-Fi. I don't know what your connection situation is. So if you are having to run wireless, it's got Wi-Fi built in, which is nice. Uh, it's even Wi-Fi 6. And to be honest, we use Wi-Fi around here a little more than we expected, even though I ran all these ethernet drops, because our Wi-Fi 6 connection is still getting us like 900 megabit per second. And we're doing it with under five milliseconds of ping on wireless. So depending on your, your distance and how much interference there is through walls, you're guaranteed to have a connection wherever you put this in your, uh, your house. But the Tough Series is a nice middle ground motherboard. It's not super cheap. It runs about $240 depending on where you buy it. There are cheaper motherboards out there, but again, this gives us a big enough VRM setup, a more robust cooling setup for the VRMs and the chokes, meaning if we want to upgrade later to a 13th series processor, which we know runs warm and is a bit power hungry, this motherboard's able to do it. If you don't plan on upgrading, you can easily save some money by going even lower spec with like a B-series motherboard like we already showed. It also has plenty of M.2 slots in there um, with a heat, heat sink plate that does actually create a little bit of cooling for your drive. We've already done a video showing how those actually do work when they make proper contact with the SSD. SSDs right now and shopping for parts today is probably where I got the most frustrated. There are There is such a huge swing in SSD performance, cost, size, and reliability. You've got Gen 3, Gen 4, and then even some Gen 5 drives on the market now. This is a Crucial P3 uh, Gen 3 from, well, G Crucial, obviously, it's on there. It's a 500 gigabyte drive. I personally recommend, and you can get this for $39.99 right now, not a bad price, but it's a 500 gigabyte Gen 3 drive, which is gonna be plenty fat. Look, most people would have a hard time. I think if we did a, like a blind taste test, not by putting up a drive speed benchmark, but just having somebody click around on the system, opening programs and stuff, they'd be hard pressed to, to tell the difference between 3,500 megabytes per second, 5,500 megabytes per second, and 7,500 megabytes per second. Save some money on that. Because if you want to go up to Gen 4, this is going to double the price. If we go up to Gen 5, you're talking hundreds of dollars now for a drive, which is going to be diminished returns. It's nice to be able to say I have that drive speed, but you're never going to notice it in your day-to-day -day operations. Now, this is a 500 gigabyte that you can currently get for $39.99 right now on Amazon. If this is your only drive, I highly recommend spending the $69 and getting one terabyte because it'll be a single drive with one terabyte and it's actually $10 cheaper than if you got two of these. Although having two of them means you could have a separate game drive and a separate OS drive, which does make things a little bit faster if your NVMe isn't having to do your OS and access all of your programs and games. But there are so many, there's, you, could, you could spend, for a Gen 3 or a Gen 4 drive, you could spend 50 bucks, you can spend 250 bucks. The pricing is everywhere. 
We've just had really good luck with Crucial. We haven't had any of their drives fail. This is not a sponsored bit by Crucial. Their controllers have worked very, very well. We get the advertised speeds. They don't run too hot. It's just one of those things where we continue to use them. Every one of our systems has them, and so does my system at home. Again, not a sponsored thing, just a reliability, trustworthy thing. Anyway, if you don't wanna buy Crucial, find something else in that price point, but I'm gonna tell you, it's not easy right now. Pricing, I think on NVMe and NAND storage right now, I think pricing is a bit volatile, which is probably why memory is also expensive right now. Power supplies. This is where you can easily cheap out too far and spend too much money. This is an NZXT C850 Gold. This is an 80 plus gold power supply that gives us modular cables. It's all black cables and it's a reasonable price. It's not cheap. It's about $124. But the thing is, I want reliability. I want a good warranty and this has a very strong warranty with it. And I want to be able to upgrade in the future to a higher end graphics card if I so choose to. The problem with going with too low end of a power supply, if you go like a 550 or a 650, which would work perfectly fine with the graphics card that we have, if you wanna upgrade later on to a higher end graphics card or a newer gen graphics card, you're gonna have to buy a new power supply with it. So an 850 is a good middle ground to know you could run a newer power supply and if you're not gonna run like a 4090 or something on this, you're just not. But if you wanna run an 80 series, like a 3080 or something in the future or whatever, like the future 4070 shows or whatever, like the 7800 XT is gonna be like, 850 is still gonna be able to support those power or those graphics cards without fear of running it out of its efficiency curve or just blowing the thing up. Now for graphics, this is probably where a lot of you were like, what's he gonna choose? I chose the GeForce RTX 3070. It, you know, it's kind of sad. Like I don't want to support necessarily Nvidia, but when it comes to the performance of the 3070 and the price point, it's so tiny. It's been so long since I've looked at this little guy. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's, man, anyway. I think that's pretty average size for a GPU. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was pretty average. Look, the 3070 is gonna give you max settings gaming, uh, gaming at 1440p. It's gonna give you very good VR experience. It's going to also give you a reasonable 4K gaming experience if you have a 4K panel. I tend to find people that have 4K panels though often shop higher in the price point that we're currently building this system. But a 1440p panel, you can be had now for 250 bucks. You're gonna want a graphics card that's gonna be able to max out your panel at the very least. Now the 3070s right now, the prices are all over the place. Now the Founders Edition card right here, um, even though they are pretty much unicorns and you can't find them, even Best Buy, which is the official reseller for Nvidia, doesn't have any, they're just unavailable. And that's because of the fact that they are probably gone. Because once they stop manufacturing Founders cards, when they move on to the next generation, when they're gone, they're gone. But I was able to find custom cards for what I consider a, a reasonable price. Remember, we're shopping new here. This is new stuff. Obviously, you'd be able to find a 3080 in the price point. We just found this 3070 used. But this is for the buyer that's just like, I want new stuff. I want a warranty. I want support. You're not going to really get a whole lot of that with, with used cards. But I was able to find the Zotac Gaming 3070 Twin Edge OC, which was a white card for 591 bucks. That's about $90 above the MSRP of the Founders Edition, which to be honest, for custom cards and stuff, that's not in the realm of being crazy. But you now have to ask yourself, are you gonna pay full retail, full MSRP for a two and a half year old card? No, it's not quite two and a half years, but it is two. And, that, and that's the most common thing you hear people say, I'm not gonna pay full price for a two year old card. Well, the amount of people that saw the prices of the 40 series quickly flipped on that scruple and immediately paid MSRP for a two year old card because they realized that the price to performance ratio of the 40 series was just too high. But what other options do you have? You don't have any other options. Right now, the as low as we go is a 4080 with the 4070 Ti on the horizon, which we all know was the fake 4080 they tried to come out with. And AMD is also reportedly launching in January a little bit lower end card. The thing is, there's still gonna be more than $591. So if you are not comfortable spending 591 bucks on a 3070 and you want a better value, well, if we just kind of take a quick peek over at eBay, you'd easily be able to find a 3080 for that price. So if I shop eBay right now, RTX 3080, here's a $625 XC3 Ultra RTX 3080. So it's 30 bucks more than this one but it's a 3080. Don't count out AMD cards either. Shopping in the 6700 XT to 6800 range is gonna give you great rasterization performance. I chose the Nvidia card only because we do turn on RTX title uh, feature sets where they're available in this studio. So RTX performance or RT performance is important to us. And if it's not important to you, then you don't have to support the green machine. You can go support the red machine. Now, one of the things you might have noticed is the Intel CPU doesn't come with a box cooler. Intel CPU stopped coming with box coolers generations ago. Uh, so I, 
Look, it is, it is so hard to beat the Vitru cooler uh, for its price to performance. I've used these quite a bit. They support all of our current socket sets. As of filming this video right now, you can get it for 34 bucks. It has four copper heat pipes with vapor chambers in there. They perform very, very well. They used to be like 27 bucks, which is when I highly recommended them because they were better than like the Hyper, the Hyper 212 Evo and all of that, which were more expensive. The problem is at 34 bucks, it really starts to encroach on the price of like Noctua. Noctua has the NHU125, which is a very similar cooler. It's a steel heat sink instead of it all being like, um, not ceramic coated, but a Cerakoted black. And it has a silver or the gray Noctua fan, which looks really good for $15 more people might be a little bit more comfortable going with an Octua brand. But again, you add 15 bucks. The cooler is something I would probably get just enough of to be able to support your CPU out of the box, unless you have extra money to spend, then maybe go with an AIO or a 240 AIO or a bigger heatsink tower. But the thing is you can always change this later. And then last but not least, our case. This is where you can easily save some money or blow some money. The Lee and Lee Landcool 216. Again, not a sponsor. None of these brands have sponsored this video in any way. The Landcool 216, it's still making its way to market. We did a review of it about a month ago. It is cheaper than the 215. It comes with a massive feature set. It can, it has an amazing airflow and it's 99 bucks. This is, if I were like shopping in this price point right now, this is exactly where I would shop. And if this, this is where this is 100% subjective, as long as it's got the cooling capability of your components that you put in there, remember the higher end the components, the more airflow and more cooling you're gonna need mid-range system like this is going to be perfectly fine with even a cardboard box technically as long as there's airflow i think 100 bucks is a is a reasonable place to put a a, a a hold basically saying you don't have to go with the land cool 216 but spend 100 bucks on a decent case check the reviews and that will land you at our total of about 1500 dollars for all of this now that's a lot of money 1500 bucks is a lot of money it's rent for many people it's probably your car payment your insurance payment your food for the month maybe your food for a couple of months um, gas for your vehicle, like 1500 bucks is a lot of money. So that's why it's important to really shop and make sure you get the most of that amount of money if you've decided to spend $1,500 on a computer, which at the end of the day is just a source of entertainment. But 1500 bucks, it just keeps on giving. You know what we gotta do now? We gotta build it. All right, so here it is all set up. You know, it's funny, once you step up the price tier out of that basic budget build, it starts to look so much prettier. Um, the Landcool 216 case, this module doesn't come with it by default. If you remember in our review, we added this. This is the RGB module, which gives you con RGB control over the fans. The only RGB fans in here are in the front, which are 180 millimeter fans. Um, I don't have it hooked up because it's not part of the, the pricing, so it's not hooked up doing anything. But normally this is a block out plate. I wanna point something out. Some folks might be saying, there's no exhaust on the top. You're gonna to overheat your system. These 180 millimeter fans that are in here move so much air that I can feel the air exhausting out the top, even though there's an exhaust fan. So massive positive pressure 
with the 12600K and the 3070 means there's plenty of cooling in here. I would ideally add at least one exhaust fan on the top personally, but it is not, I, I was a little concerned initially, but remember there's a 180 millimeter fans in the front, not 140s. Uh, fan control right now too is also running like pretty much at full speed. I think the problem right now is I actually don't have the case fans hooked up to the motherboard. So everything's off set to, to max speed, but that could obviously all be changed and tuned later. Um, moving on, by default, uh, there's a couple of settings that I changed. So one of the benefits of going Intel is the fact that they overclock very well. Now I didn't do any manual overclocking here. All I did was enable XMP, which brings us from 2133 base megahertz on DDR4 up to 3200, which is our advertised paid for speeds, timing 16, 18, 18, 36. I did the remove all limits. This cooler, the CPU is idling at 28, 29C right now. I'm telling you that this cooler is beyond good for its price. I've had lots of people buy it and then tell me like, oh my God, I wanted to try it because it was so cheap. I, it's so much better than I expected. There's even, even been other people that have done reviews on this cooler based on my review, I guess trying to prove that it was terrible and then their conclusion ended up being that it was great or at least good depending on their standards. So moving on, I remove all the limits that way it can turbo time longer, boost, higher and stay up there for a longer period of time. Thermal velocity boost and the turbo timer stuff is very reserved. It only goes for 56 seconds and then it drops down. If you have the proper cooling and power delivery, you can let it run like that at all times. And that's what I do with this build. That's it. Even the voltage is on auto. With that, let's boot it up. Let's take a look at what the uh, Cinebench score is. And then in terms of 3070 performance, it's gonna perform like a 3070. I mean, this is a over two year old graphics card now. There's no surprises of what its performance is like. The 12600K is not gonna bottleneck it in any way whatsoever. It's gonna perform admirably. Like you're gonna get your full performance you've paid for out of it with a 12600. If you were to go down to like a 9700 9, or something like that, or even like a 9600K, then you would potentially start seeing some bottlenecking on a 3070. Very unlikely, especially since we'd be gaming at 1440p because that is our resolution target here, which takes a lot of load off the CPU. Um, so we'll do Cinebench R23. I like doing R23 just as an initial test for both temperatures and just to see if we are performing anywhere where we should be in, in its expected range. And it's free. So if you wanna compare your system to my system, you can go download Cinebench R23 and then you can directly compare how your performance is to this one. Some, I've had people actually do the very same thing. They'll say, I downloaded R23 because I wanted to compare my performance to yours because I had the same CPU and mine was performing really low. And they were able to actually figure out they weren't running prop, like something was off in their system. They were able to go in, kind of figure it out and get performance I didn't even know they were losing. So I always recommend play along if you want to. This is going to perform higher than a standard 12600K because of the fact that I have those enhancements enabled and I have those limits removed. So you're gonna notice the score is higher than out of the box 12600Ks because again, if your cooling is there, your power delivery is there and your motherboard quality is there and your CPU silicon quality is there, which doesn't take much to just remove the limits, then you're gonna get free performance for simply clicking a button. And just about every single motherboard, whether it be Asus, MSI, Gigabyte, EVGA, they all have these types of remove limits in their motherboards. You just have to look up the manual for your particular motherboard to see uh, where they are. And with that, the run's just about done. And our score here was a 17,385. The funny thing about that is that 16,315 underneath it, that's a Threadripper 1950X. So it really shows how, you know, a six year old, almost seven year old Threadripper um, is now being beaten, at least in this particular test, in this instruction set, by a mid-range $224 CPU. It's pretty impressive what the CPU battles have done for your value of buying a CPU. Now, if we were to also compare that 17300 uh, and 85 range right there, you'll find it's beating an 11900K. You'll find it's beating a 10900K, which is more impressive than the 11900. Remember the 11900, they removed two cores and four threads. The 10900 is a 10 core, 20 thread CPU. It's the same CPU I have in my system at home. This rig is CPU wise, in Cinebench faster than my personal rig at home. You can see why it was an easy choice for 200 and some odd dollars. In fact, looking it up right now, the 5800X score is a 15,100 and some change. So this is 1200 points higher than it. Again, one instruction set. We know Intel does really good at Cinebench. So does AMD though, especially AM5 CPUs. They do amazing and they scale very well. 
So again, for being a straight up gaming PC, which is the whole point of this system, targeting 1440p max settings, um, I feel like the 12600K is a better target. If you had more money to blow, and again, you're okay with that dead end upgradability path, which we talked about, at $100 more, the 5800X3D would be the better gaming CPU. But again, this build's primary focus was having an upgrade path, which at least, is, at least gives us one generation newer CPU and like three tiers higher than we currently have using all the same stuff. Just plopping out the CPU and putting in a new one, selling your 12600K for maybe 199 bucks, 200 bucks, 175 bucks, depending. You have a friend maybe that wants to upgrade. Now you're paying 60 bucks, 70 bucks for a new CPU. And then you're gonna be able to uh, get even more performance by changing out one component. You can save the cooler, cooler will work with it. Same RAM, same GPU, same motherboard, same power supply, same everything. So with that rationale out of, out of the way, let's go ahead and take a look at something like, I don't know, I guess Forza. Okay, so we're at 1440p, we're at ultra settings. As soon as it drops from here, I'll show you. I'll be calling out the FPS, which is showing in the corner. V-Sync is off. And then in graphics settings, we are at ultra. There is one setting higher than that. I don't, I didn't use it. Um, it's extreme, which is ultra is fine. We are at 110 FPS right now. Actually, I like this view right here. Wee! Oh my God. It's 160 FPS, 144. You see why the 3070, you know, depending on the title, like this isn't a super hard title to run, but I did, when it first came out, I did see a lot of folks with older systems saying that it would fluctuate really bad. Yeah, it's averaging right around 140, 138. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's pretty obvious this is a very capable gaming system. I don't think anyone would actually argue that a 12600K with a 3070, with an NVMe SSD, an 850 watt power supply, Z670 motherboard with 16 gigs of DDR4 doesn't qualify as a mid to high end gaming rig. So anyway, guys, I'll put a link to all these parts that I use down in the description below. You'll see it adds up before like taxes and stuff to about 1500. The tax is gonna depend on your region. Like even different parts of SoCal have different tax rates. The hardest part of this build honestly is gonna be choosing the graphics card and finding the right one. But like I said, $591, you can get a custom 3070, which won't have the ugly adapter on there, which is the worst part about this build. One of the things that's actually really neat about this build and this case and why I highly recommend the Landcool 216, not sponsored. This is the first build I've done that I can recall ever not having to use a single zip tie to cable manage the thing. There's not a single zip tie in the back of this because it has such well thought out cable channels, the way that the zip ties work, there's even like a, a hoop that the zip tie goes over so you can have cables going down one side of the zip tie and up the other side of the zip tie and using the same, or not zip tie, but Velcro to hold it down without interfering with the other side. It's got these tabs on the back that are just pressure tabs to push cables up inside. It is insane the amount of cable management that's actually thought into this without needing zip ties and things. So anyway, there you go. If you're looking for a mid-range system and you needed some ideas of what I would build in this price point that gives you an upgrade path in the future, this is it right here. Especially considering the fact that the 12600K is beating 900 series CPUs for the previous gen. Even the most previous one, which was the 1100K, this is beating. There was a huge uplift in 12 series because, or 12th gen because of the performance AMD was having. Intel had to respond, which is much higher IPC, much higher core clocks, and the efficiency cores it's, it's like the starting point of where I would truly recommend Intel if you're going that route. Otherwise, 5800X or 5800X 3D if you're only hell-bent on gaming and you have a little bit more money to spend. All right, guys, thanks for watching. How would you spend 1500 bucks? Sign off in the comments down below. I'll see you guys in the next one.